Thanks, Bo. It's great to be back with you guys here in Texas, where everything is bigger and better in Texas, and you can go 75 miles an hour on the freeway. Love that. Love that. I don't know if you know that or not. That's not the normal speed limit around the country, but here in Texas, we're going faster. Uh, my name's Dave Rhodes. Great to be back with you guys. Was with you at Chi Alpha a couple years ago. Bo called me up and said, will you do camp? And honestly, the schedule was already booked for the summer. We were already said yes to all the things we're going to say yes to, but how could I turn you guys down, right? So we made some room in the schedule, and I'm looking forward to being here with you all week. Uh, again, my name is Dave. I am married to my wife, Kim. have two daughters, Emma, who was here with me last time. You might remember Izzy, uh, who is my youngest daughter. And now, this time, I've got Frankie here with me, uh, who is my 10-year-old son, um, who's going to be hanging out. So me and Frankie will be here with you this evening. Looking forward to the things that God's going to say to us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll get started. Father, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the way that you intersect our lives, even in moments that may be uncomfortable to us or might disrupt our reality. So God, we're inviting you to disrupt us tonight. We're inviting you to interrupt us, to speak to us, to touch us, to call us, to move us. We love you, Lord. In your name, amen. Well, I don't know if you know it or not, but we live in a story culture. We may not like to read anymore, but we love stories. Let's just do a little survey here in the room. How many of you in the last two or three weeks have been to a movie? Raise your hand. How many of you in the last two or three weeks have been to a red box or on your TV, you rented a movie on TV? How many of you in the last three weeks have just been flipping channels through the television and you got stuck in a movie and watched it? And anyone in the room say, Dave, in the last three weeks I've been to a movie, I've rented a movie, and I've just watched a movie on my television. Anyone like that in the room? All right, these are the people in the room without a life, right? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm one of these people. We love story. We love to watch stories. There's lots of different ways we can watch stories. Some people just are there to critique it. Others are there to just say they can do that. But, but the reason people write stories, I think, is because they're inviting us to get lost and found in the story. Speaking of stories, if you had to write your story in six words, what would you write? What would you want those six words to be? If someone else was writing your story in six words, what would they choose those six words to be? It's a challenge that legend tells us goes back to the days of Ernest Hemingway, the great American writer. He was walking down the street one day when a woman came up to him and said, can you write a compelling story in six words? Hemingway took the challenge, retired to his house for a while, and a short while later came back with this six-word story. For sale, baby's shoes never worn. For sale, baby's shoes never worn. With those six words, Hemingway stirred our emotions and stoked our imaginations. If you just think about those six words, so much is told in such few words. And ever since that time, people have been taking the Hemingway challenge to try and write their story in six words. They've been compiled in a book called Not Quite What I Was Planning, which is a six-word title of someone's six-word story. So what would your six-word story, would, what would it be? So we think about ours, we could talk about the six-word story of other things, for instance. If you wanted to write the six-word story of Little Caesar's Pizza in six words, what six words would you choose? It's five bucks for a reason. That's the six words that I would choose for Little Caesar's. If you had to write the story of Taco Bell in six words, what would those six words be? Outside the bun, inside the bathroom. That was, that's the six words. If you had to write the story of Mike Tyson in six words, what would it be? Friends, countrymen, lend me your ears. Those would be the six words. If you had to tell the story of David Hasselhoff in six words, what would those be? America's got talent. I do not. Those are the six words that I would choose. I'm just kidding. 
Six words. If you had to tell your story in six words, what would those six words be? You think it's no coincidence that most of the Bible is written in story. It's an invitation from God for us to lose ourselves and find ourselves in his story. It didn't have to be that way. You know, God could have just dropped a big theology down and told us exactly what to believe in every kind of situation. There are parts of the Bible that read like this, but most of the Bible is written in story. God could have just dropped a big rule book down and told you what to do in every single moment of your life, and there are parts of the Bible that read this way, but most of the Bible's written in story. Why? Maybe it's because God is inviting us to lose ourselves and find ourselves in the story. Maybe God's not as interested in controlling our behavior as he is in captivating our heart. And tonight, I'm going to invite you into a story We're going to look at a couple of the characters and try and name their six-word story. But we're going to look at their story to begin asking ourselves, what's our story? Where's our identity found? What, What character in this story do we most identify with? What six word story might be the story of our lives? We're going to be in Mark chapter 3 tonight. Mark chapter 3. Matthew chapter 12 and Luke chapter 6. Mark chapter 3, Matthew chapter 12, Luke chapter 6. You don't have to turn to all those places. We'll just be in Mark chapter 3. We're going to read the same story, though, from three different gospels who give us a little bit of different details as we read the story. Now, as we jump into this story, the story that we're going to read tonight is a hinge moment in Jesus' life and ministry. It's a moment where what he does in this story changes the trajectory of his life in ministry. Jesus, up to this point in the book of Mark, has been talking about this radical reality of the kingdom of God. That God's rule and reign is close and near at hand. And he hasn't just been talking about it. He's been bringing it where everywhere he goes, things are being flipped upside down and turned right side up. And as Jesus is bringing this radical reality of the kingdom of God, there are those who are incredibly attracted to it because they've been repelled by all the religions of their day. And yet there are those who are disturbed by it because Jesus isn't fitting into their religious institution. He's not fitting into their system. And there's a reason why Jesus isn't doing that. It's because he doesn't want to. He's coming to flip it upside down and turn it right side up. And here in Mark chapter 3, we get a small story that totally changes everything. We're going to read it in Mark, which is kind of the Twitter version of the Gospels. Mark just tells it right like it is and doesn't give a whole lot of detail. He just does it in 140 characters. Verse 1, here's the way Mark tells the story. He says, another time he, and that's Jesus, went to the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent, and that's the Pharisees. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. You might want to circle that stubborn hearts. Said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 9, same story says, going on from that place, he, and that's Jesus, went into their synagogue. And a man with a shriveled hand was there, looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. They asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out. It was completely restored, just as 
uh, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Luke chapter 6, same story one more time because I want us to really hear this. Luke's a doctor and so he gives us some different details on the story. Verse 6, it says, on another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue, and that's Jesus, and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? He looked around at all of them and then said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. But they were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. Do you get the story there? Jesus is talking and bringing this radical reality of the kingdom of God. And again, some people are inspired by it, and some people are disturbed by it, but this message of the kingdom of God brings him one day into a synagogue. Matthew tells us it's their synagogue. Jesus is playing an away game here. He's on the Pharisees' turf. And when he walks into the synagogue, there are a couple of things going on. It's a bit of an awkward kind of situation. There's a moment where Jesus has a sense that he's being set up. It's an awkward moment where he's being set up. If you've, if you've ever been asked to go snipe hunting, you know this moment. If anyone's ever asked you to play that jelly bean game, bamboozled, you know this kind of moment. Guys, if anyone has ever said, smell this to you, you know that kind of moment. You're being set up. That moment will happen before we leave camp, I promise. Someone's going to be like, smell this. You'll be like, why are you wanting me to smell? That's awful. It's awful. Yes, yes, it's awful. Your socks smell awful. It's that moment where you're, where you're, being, you're being set up. And the things that Jesus is being set up here is that the Bible tells us a couple details that feel a little incidental at first. They say it's the Sabbath day. Now, on the Sabbath day, the Sabbath day for Israel was this this identity marker of what their faith was all about. It's what separated them from other nations. It's what made them special in the eyes of God, they thought, because the Sabbath day was the day where they would rest, they would do no work as as a symbol of God's creation, where God created in six days and then he rested. There was even one of the commandments that said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It was one of the ways that Israel separated their religion from other religions. And the Pharisees were a group of people who rose up at this time called the exile where Israel had just gone their own way and done their own thing and married their religion to so many different other religions. And God said, all right, then have it your way. And so they were taken to a foreign country. And the Pharisees are a sect that raise up to say, we're never going to let that happen again. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to make sure we keep the law. We're going to put a wall around the law and a wall around the wall around the law. We're going to make sure that never happens again. In fact, they began to believe if we could just be good enough, the Messiah will come. And so they had very detailed lists about what you could do and not do on the Sabbath, how many, de- how many steps you could walk, what, what things were legal to do, and one of the things that you were allowed to do in the, on the Sabbath was heal anyone because that was considered work. Ironically, if your sheep fell into a um, trap or fell into a thicket or fell into a place that needed to be pulled out, you could pull them out and save them. And so here's a guy who's been placed, as a guy, the Bible says, has a shriveled hand. It's almost as if the Pharisees have brought this guy into the synagogue where they know Jesus is going to be on the Sabbath because they want to test to see if Jesus will break the Sabbath and, and heal the guy. And Jesus is in a kind of no-win situation because if he heals the guy, he breaks the Sabbath. But if he doesn't heal the guy, he breaks the guy's heart. The question is, what's Jesus going to do? And students, I want you to know the things that Jesus does in this passage, they're stunning. 
Most of the time when Jesus heals someone, he takes them over to a corner and prays over them or does something and heals them. It's almost like I don't want anyone to know. It's almost like he often tells them, don't tell anyone about what I did. But in this moment, Jesus breaks code as if he's saying, I want everyone to see what I'm about to do in this moment. This moment, he calls this guy up in front of everyone as if to say, don't miss this. And he asks the guy whose right hand is withered. He says, stretch out your hand. And when he stretches out his hand, his hand is completely restored. And it's in this moment that the Pharisees see what Jesus has done. He's threatening the religion they hold dear. And they look at him and say, we're going to have to kill him. We're going to have to kill him. Jesus disturbs their reality where they're hiding behind a religion and ritual. Jesus is calling them to something more than those things. Where where the Pharisees are hiding behind a kind of moral mandate. What Jesus understands is that they're, they're missing the core of what faith is all about. And so it's in this moment That Jesus knows, the Pharisees are asking the question, will Jesus heal on the Sabbath? But Jesus is asking the question, will the Pharisees allow the Sabbath to be healed? Because when it gets to the core of the Sabbath, it's not just about rest, it's about restoration. And here's a guy in the story, Luke tells us, it's his right hand that's withered. The right hand in that culture is the working hand. The right hand is the greeting hand. The right hand is the strong hand. Not to be crass, and you can read an article that was just out on CNN a couple weeks ago about still today in the Middle East, you don't shake anyone with the left hand because in that culture, not to be crass, but the left hand is considered the toilet hand. So here's a guy who his entire life has been having to greet with the toilet, has been cha- and unable to work. Here's a guy who hasn't rested a day in his life. His entire life has been marked by the brokenness in his life that everyone can see. And in this moment, the Pharisees who are cowering behind their religion have this guy in the synagogue. And Jesus breaks the rules for those broken by the rules. And he calls this guy up and he heals his hand. But listen, he's not freeing this man from the Sabbath. He's freeing this man for the Sabbath. This man, after this moment, is free to Sabbath for the first time in his life. It's a significant moment. It's this moment that determines the future of Jesus' ministry where the Pharisees decide we've got to get rid of Jesus because Jesus strikes a blow at their religion. He strikes a blow at their ritual. He strikes a blow at their moral mandate and calls them back to the heart of faith. And it's in this story, guys, that we see a couple of different places that we can identify with our own stories. The first one is this. For some of us in the room, we identify with the guy with the shriveled hand. At a very basic level, this is a story of healing and possibility. It's a story of grace and restoration in life. If I could put this man's story in six words, here's the six words I would choose. This man is, ready, hoping for a word from God. Or you might say, hoping for a touch from God. Here's a guy who hasn't rested at all. His brokenness is available for everyone to see. We don't know why he's broken. Maybe it's a decision that he made that happened to him. Maybe he was born that way. Maybe it's something that someone else did to him. But all we know is here is a guy who is broken. Here is a guy who every day of his life is a struggle. And what he desperately needs is God to touch his life, or if he doesn't touch it, at least speak into it to make his struggle make 
sense. Look here, some of you came into camp this week and this year has been hell. For some of you, it's not this year, it's the last five years or the last 10 years and you're coming into a setting like this and you are sitting here saying, my life, it's broken. My life is falling apart. My life, maybe it's because of a decision your parents made, or maybe it's because of a decision that one of your friends made, or maybe it's because of a decision that you've made. We don't have to talk about all the reasons why you might be broken. The truth is, you're broken, and you know it. And you're coming to camp this year, And you're saying, God, I need you to touch me. But if you don't touch me, I at least need you to speak a word (coughs) into this struggle. I I get a chance to fly a lot. I, I go to a lot of different places and speak and do consulting and different things like that. And most of the time when I fly, I fly in Delta. I live in Atlanta, so I fly Delta everywhere. I like Delta. And one of the reasons I like Delta, then how to treat their customers, not just on the check-in lines, different things like that. But whenever we're going to go through a storm or whenever we're going to go through bad weather, I like the fact that the captain or the pilot gets on the speaker and says, hey, guys, we're going to be going through some weather. It's going to be a little bit bumpy. Just want you to know we've got everything taken care of. But a couple of years ago, I couldn't take a Delta flight. I had to take a little cheaper airline called Allegiant. I don't know if you've ever flown Allegiant. You get like a $19 flight, which makes you worried. I think their six-word story is, we hope to get you there. I think that's their six-word story. Um, and I remember I was flying on Allegiant out of Greenville, South Carolina, and it was a high wind advisory day. I get on the plane, and I'm not joking. The kid that's sitting beside me looks at his mom and says, is this the kind of plane that does flips? I'm thinking, this is not good. This is not good for anyone. The wind is blowing. When the Wicked Witch of the West flew by on her broomstick, I knew we were in trouble that day. But we got on the plane. The plane took off. When the plane took off, the wind hit the plane. I'm not joking. The plane like went up on its side this way and went up on its side this way. And then the whole rest of the trip, it was just bumpy all over the place. But the thing that was most disturbing about that ride is that the captain never got on and said anything. He just acted like that was normal for an Allegiant flight. Some of you are here tonight, and the truth is the turbulence of your life has been turned up, and you're coming into camp, and the desperate need of your heart is you need to hear a word from God. You need to get a touch from God this week. And the good news of this story is that God breaks into broken moments. God moves into the neighborhood in the places where people are struggling. That God speaks and God moves and God touches and God changes things. Even in Exodus chapter 2 when the people of God have been in a struggle not for a few moments but for 430 years. And it seems like God has grown silent. Moses, in writing the Exodus, talks about what God's been doing in the moments where it looks like he's silent. Here's what he says in verse 23. He says, during that long period, the king of Egypt died, and the Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. And here's what God's been doing. This is what Moses is saying. Even the moments where God seems like he's silent, here's what you need to know about God. Verse 24, it says, God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Here in Exodus chapter 2, maybe you've been in a moment where you felt like God's silent. I've been in moments, dark moments, where it feels like I need God to speak and God is silent. But here Moses is saying, in the midst of that silence, here's what you need to know God is doing. He's saying, God heard. Can I just tell you that while you're in the middle of your struggle, God hears you. God's not distracted. He doesn't need to turn his hearing in up. He's not distracted by the news stories of the day, so much so that he can't hear your cry. In fact, as Christians, one of the things that we believe about prayer is that in some mysterious way, we hold the ears of God captive. And I want to tell you, in your broken situation, as you're crying out, I want to tell you, God hears. 
God heard their cry. He remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God's not just hearing, he's remembering. He's remembering that, that at, at the heart of who God is, is that he's a relational God. He's not simply served by rituals or religion, but from the very beginning, he's been establishing a family for himself, that he's a covenantal God who's deeply intertwined with his people where what they do affects him. And he remembers his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Can I just tell you, God's remembering you. God heard their groaning. He remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and Jacob. So God looked on them. He saw. He didn't drop his contact lens. He didn't need glasses. He wasn't like the refs of the NBA Finals who were always checking the instant replay. He saw. He saw. Can I just tell you, God sees. He sees you in the midst of that brokenness. He's not aloof somewhere. He looks and he sees. And then that last word, he looked on them and was concerned about them. The Hebrew word there is that he knew. It's the word that would describe a marriage relationship where a man knew a woman or a woman knew a man. There's an intimacy there. And at the root of that no is that he takes their struggle. He empathizes. He takes their struggle upon himself. See, if you've come into camp this week and you've got some stuff going on, we're going to talk about this more tomorrow night, but some of you are here and you need to know what's God doing. And I want to tell you, in the middle of your struggle, God sees and he remembers and he He hears and he knows and the rest of the book of Exodus is that he acts. Look here, students, look here. See, I don't know what God's gonna do in your life, but I can tell you this. If it's not good yet, then God's not done. And whatever brokenness you find yourself in, God specializes in touching that situation. Here's a guy whose entire life has been about embarrassment and shame and the inability to work and the restlessness of this withered hand in his life. And it's in this moment, maybe for the first time in his life, as Jesus enters this story, that Jesus changes his story. Jesus removes the brokenness and brings beauty in the midst of it. And that brings us to the second place we could identify. Maybe for some of you, this week is not about identifying with a man. Maybe for some of you, the place that you need to identify this week is with Jesus. Have you ever noticed that oftentimes as Christians, we identify with everyone else in the story but Jesus? But as Christians, we're supposed to be like Christ. So as we read the Gospels, we're not just reading it from the perspective of people who need Jesus. We're reading from perspective of what should our life look like? And so as we look at Jesus, what we find is not only is this a story of healing and possibility, it's also a story of opportunity and calling. At a different level, not necessarily a deeper level, just a different level, we could look at this story and find what our lives are supposed to be about by identifying with Jesus. That as we watch Jesus, we find a sense of calling for our lives. Some of you are here in the room tonight, and it's not that you're going through a deep struggle and need a touch from God. The call from your life this week is to be the touch of God. See, it's one thing to be touched by the hands and feet of Jesus. It's another thing to become the hands and feet of Jesus. See, this story challenges us not to just trust God's heart when we can't see God's hand, but this story challenges your and my faith because some of you are in the room and the move that you need to make this week is this. You need to move from faith in Jesus to the faith of Jesus. Let me say that again. Some of you, the move you need to make this week is a move from faith in Jesus to the faith of Jesus. This is what the book of James is gonna push us toward. 
Because James will not allow us to simply just have faith in Jesus. James is saying, if you've been transformed by the grace of God, you've got to begin carrying out that grace of God. If you've been touched by God, then you've got to become the hands and feet of God. And some of you are here this week, and the truth is, your faith life is simply a faith in Jesus faith life where Jesus just kind of functions you know, like insurance for you. How, how many of you drive in the room? How, how many of you got a driver's license? How, how many of you today thought about your car insurance? You didn't. Maybe one of you got in a wreck. See, I have car insurance. I've had, I've had car insurance for lots of years of my life. You know the only time I think about car insurance? It's when I'm in a wreck. It's the only time I think about it. Some of you, your life of faith is simply an insurance policy that you pull out any time that you're in a wreck. And God this week wants to captivate you. He wants to crawl up in your lap and move you from just having faith in Jesus to having the faith of Jesus, to dare to go to the broken places, to dare to go in the places that make you uncomfortable, to dare to touch the things that seem untouchable, to dare to find not just opportunity for your life, but calling for your life. I wonder how many of us, our faith is just simply an insurance policy that we park over here, and anytime we're in trouble, I want to have faith in you, Jesus. It may be at the end of our life, it's just an insurance policy. I want to have faith in you, Jesus. When we read the book of James this week in your Bible study, James will not let us do that. James will look at it and say, show me your faith by your works. You say you have faith then how is that faith not just simply coming to you, but how is it moving through you? Because here's the deal, students. You will never fully, you'll never really understand the grace of God until that grace moves through you. David Siemens, who is kind of the pioneer of Christian counseling, said it this way. He said, many years ago, I was driven to the conclusion that the two major, crises, uh, major causes of emotional problems among evangelical Christians are these. One, the failure to understand, receive, and live out God's unconditional grace and forgiveness. And two, the failure to give out that unconditional love and forgiveness and grace to other people. We read, we hear, we believe a good theology of grace, but it's not the way that we live. The good news of the gospel of grace has not penetrated the level of our emotions. For some of you, you know, what that means is, you know, to experience the grace of God, you gotta learn to give grace to a boyfriend that burned you or a girlfriend that scorched you. You gotta learn to give grace to a friend that did something bad to you because only you're gonna learn the depths of the love of God and the mercy of God and the grace of God is not by just simply receiving that in a crisis but daring to give that to those who have hurt you. See, this is different. This differentiates Jesus from the Pharisees. Jesus' life is moving in totally different direction. The Pharisees are drawing lines, but Jesus is crossing lines. The Pharisees are making distinctions, but Jesus is bridging gaps. The Pharisees are trying to contain brokenness, but Jesus is healing brokenness. The Pharisees are managing truth, but, the, but Jesus is releasing truth. The Pharisees are worried about being right, but Jesus is more concerned with being good. The Pharisees are demonstrating, are, are domesticating, sorry, faith. Jesus is demonstrating faith. And I want to just ask you, what does your faith look like? Does it look like the Pharisees or does it look like Jesus? Has it caused you to bridge any gaps? Has it caused you to get uncomfortable in any kind of way? Has it caused you to go somewhere that you might not have gone without Jesus? Has it caused you to not, give, to not, to not just simply be right, but to give up the right to be right in order to be good? Because you could be right and wrong at the same time. Students, I, I just want to let you know, I'm, I'm burdened by a Christian faith that too often times doesn't look like the faith of Jesus. There's a third place that we can look in this story to identify. If we don't identify with the man and we don't identify with Jesus, we could identify with the Pharisees. See, if the man is hoping for a word from God, 
and Jesus is helping with the work of God. Then the sixth word story of the Pharisees is this. The Pharisees are standing in the way of God. The people who should be pointing to Jesus are actually standing in the way of Jesus. As much as this is a story of healing and grace and restoration in life, it is also a story of unhealing, ungrace, resentment and death. It's not just a story of opportunity and calling or healing and hope. It is also a story of liability and conviction. Because here's the irony, students. When you read this story, at first it just looks like one person is broken, but the truth of this story is there's not just one person broken in it. There's one person whose brokenness is evident to everyone on his hand. He's got a brokenness that he cannot hide. He's got a brokenness that everyone sees, but there is more than one broken person in this story. There's at least two, really a whole group of them. The man has a brokenness that he can't hide, but the Pharisees, they're broken inside. And they can mask their brokenness underneath all the religious outward appearance. They know all the rules. They know all the right things to say, and yet inside there's a brokenness. They don't have a withered hand, but what they have is a withered heart. I want to tell you, it's easy to come into a camp setting like this. You've been around the church thing. You know that God answers. You know how to answer in small group, and you could spend your entire week hiding the brokenness of your heart that inside there's no passion for God. Inside there's no love for God. Inside your heart is just withered. You could point out everyone else's brokenness with never dealing with your own brokenness. And guys, here's the irony of the story. Sometimes I think it's easier for God to heal a withered hand than it is to heal a withered heart. Mark says they had stubborn hearts. Their hearts were hardened. It's as if they're trying to do the rules so the Messiah will come, but they're missing the Messiah for whom they're waiting. And look here, guys, look here. You might have been around this church thing for a long time. You might know all the answers. You might know how to do all the right stuff, but inside your heart is just getting tinier and tinier and tinier and tinier. And I'll talk about this tomorrow morning. That's where I was as a junior in high school at a camp like this. When I decided to read the book of James against a big oak tree. One of the reasons I came to this camp this summer, when I found out the guys were were talking about James, for me as a junior in high school sitting against a big oak tree, oak tree, God crawled up in my lap as I read the book of James. And he showed me that even though on the outside I had all the forms, my heart was withering. Did that as a junior. God got into my life. I'll talk about that tomorrow morning a little bit. Made some decisions. Went back and tried to live them out and got so scared. Came back, the same campground, same book of James, same oak tree, same disturbance. God began to grow my heart. Never gotten over it. I I brought my, my measuring tape in tonight. Because we live in a world that's measuring everything. And, and for some of us, when we take the measuring tape out, we think that it's, you know, we put it around our head, it's about what we know. Some of you, I mean, I, I, we live in a competitive school district in Atlanta, and there's so much pressure. It's all about getting the right grades and being in the right classes. And if you're not careful, you can think that it's just about, 
you know, put the measuring tape around your head. Some of you are here, and you put the measuring tape around your arms. It's about how powerful you are. It's about what you can do. It's about what, what you, ha- you, know, you have power over. It's about your, your skill or ability in a game. There's nothing wrong with being good at a game. But before you know it, your identity is just all in your arms. For some of you, it's about your legs. It's about where you're going, where you're moving to. But look here tonight. Students, I want you to know when God takes his measuring tape out, he's not putting it around your head. and He's not simply putting it around your legs or your arms. When God's taking his measuring tape out, he's placing it around your heart. Some of you are here, and the truth is, you came into camp, And on the outside, everything looks fine. But if God put his measuring tape around your heart, it'd be like, let me try. It's teensy, teensy, little, little. And what God wants to do is he wants to expand your heart this week. Your heart for him. What would it look like to just say, I I want my heart for God to be so enormous that it'd be hard to even get the measuring tape around it because here's the deal i may not have you know the greatest brains i may not have the greatest gifts talents ability i may not have you know the greatest legs of going somewhere but i want to be marked by someone who has a big heart for god This is James's story you'll be studying all week. If I could put James's story in six words. James, a servant of God and Jesus. What's your story? Where do you fit in this story? What is this story? speaking about what God might want to do over the next few days that we're together. And what would it look like? What would it look like for you to allow God to speak or touch you? What what would it look like for you to move from just having faith in Jesus to the faith of Jesus? What would it look like for God to expand your heart? heart I don't know I don't know but I do know this if you'll read the book of James in your Bible study your devotions the Holy Spirit will crawl up in your lap he'll confront you and convict you about some things but if you have the courage he'll also grow you in ways and maybe it might just change your trajectory as well. Let's pray. Father, I pray for the person in this room that has stumbled their way on this trip wondering if you even care about them. And I pray this weekend you will grab hold of their eyes and their ears. Let them know that you are seeing, that you are hearing. Touch them, God. I pray for the person in this room who started relationship with you, but you're just an insurance policy to them. And this week you want to make their faith real. You want it not just to move to them, but to move through them. I pray for the person in this room that behind the veneer of the exterior shell where it looks like they have it all together and yet inside they have a withered heart, God, would you expand their heart tonight? Would you expand their heart this week? So we come as a church tonight in worship, in conversation. Bearing our hearts and souls to you, God. That's all worship is. It's my heart coming into connection with God's heart and our heart beating for the same things. So God, as we worship tonight, 
May your heart affect our heart. May your rhythm affect the way our heart beats. May we see you, Jesus, for who you are. May we get unstuck from religion and instead find what true religion actually looks like. And that is a faith that is active with you. We love you, Lord. In your name, amen.